The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning, as you know, we are continuing our Lenten sermon series about igniting your spirit to find heaven on earth. And we're focusing today on this question, how do I live as my best self? Okay, so if you Google my best self, you get a lot of hits about positive psychology and mindfulness and self-compassion. In fact, the top search result is a website called My Best Self 101. It's a real thing. It offers a 20-item survey on human flourishing, as well as an 85-item survey to help you select the right tool to improve your well-being. Now, there is nothing wrong with any of that. That is great stuff. I mean, human flourishing sounds pretty appealing to me, and I would be grateful to find just the right tool to improve my well-being. My hunch is that tool might be an exercise bike, but that's a, <laughs> that's a different sermon for another time. But nowhere on that list of search results will you find the Ten Commandments, our Old Testament reading today. But oddly enough, I would say those Ten Commandments are all about human flourishing. The question is, where and how do you see it happening? So my best self 101, like most of the rest of the culture, sees us flourishing from within. And that is because our culture sees us primarily as individuals. Autonomous beings who, you know, bump up against each other sometimes, but fundamentally find our purpose and meaning internally. But I kind of think our spiritual tradition would say just the opposite. I mean, that tradition begins with people living together with God in paradise, only to lose the best deal ever by thinking we could improve it on our own. (laughs) But it's the brokenness we all share that the right alongside the image and likeness of God lies our original sin, the idolatry of self-worship. And healing that brokenness is the story of salvation. Time and time again, God reaches out to beloved humans and asks us to to look past ourselves to find our well-being. And one of the most memorable times that God does this is the moment we heard about this morning, the the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now, the reading we had today just gives the commandments themselves, but let's back up a couple of verses, a few verses, to see what's happening. Because this is not exactly a warm and fuzzy moment in salvation history. The divine presence descends on Mount Sinai in cloud and smoke and fire as as trumpets and thunder herald a God who might well be coming to make war on wayward humans. So Moses brings the people to the foot of the mountain to meet God, and the people are scared out of their minds. Then they, they hear these laws from God, with Moses translating for the frightened crowd a list of ten restrictions 
eight of them explicitly framed in negativity. Thou shalt not, dot, dot, dot. And yet, you know, if you're looking for a guide to help live as your best self, I think these Ten Commandments are a great place to start. And here's why. This covenant that God invites us into, this covenant invites us to turn away from seeing ourselves as the center of the universe. Instead, counterintuitively, God shows us that we can find our best selves not by looking deep within, but by looking outward. Not by maximizing our potential, but by limiting ourselves for the sake of relationship. So how does that work? Well, it might help to see what these Ten Commandments actually say. (laughs) I mean, we hear about the Ten Commandments all the time. How many of us could name them? (laughs) Right. So to start out, notice that the Ten Commandments come in two blocks. The first four of them are about our relationship with God, and the last six are about our relationship with our neighbors. So here are the first four about relating to God. Number one, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So apparently our our starting place is to recognize which God is God. I mean, we're not we're worshiping golden calves anymore. We're, our, our idols now do a better job of blending in. Idols of, of power and wealth and beauty and success and freedom and progress. I mean, none of these things is inherently bad. In, in fact, all of them are gifts from God but they aren't God. (laughs) And we'll be happier if we don't substitute them for the one who is. And continuing that thought, here's number two. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So I hear two things here. That God is so much more, you know, so far beyond our experience that that any attempt to capture God physically is going to try to put transcendent divinity into a box of limited human imagination. So, metaphors, great. But idols can make us think that we're wise enough to comprehend the incomprehensible. And with that, Worshipping that which isn't God is an insult to the one who is. A slap in the face to the creator who's trying to bring us back into paradise. Okay, then number three. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. And why not? Well, because it's an insult. Again, you know, for the Hebrews, the divine name was so holy they couldn't, didn't speak it. That they would only represent it with letters that you couldn't pronounce, actually. What we transliterate as Y-H-W-H. And and the name of God that they used was instead a title, which we translate as the Lord. It's a recognition that God can't be managed, can't be reduced down to human language. And of course, even more insulting is using that divine name as sort of spoken, bold-faced type demeaning what is ultimately holy into crude interjections to give our fleeting feelings a little more pop. And here's the last of the commandments about our relationship with God. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. (laughs) This one ought to make us stop short. I mean, first, it's only one of two that is not a thou shalt not. Second, This one is the longest of the ten, going on for four verses about how to apply it. Third, it applies to all people in the Israelites' community. I mean, the people of Israel themselves and everyone in their midst, and the animals. So why does it get so much attention? Because I think, at least, this is the ultimate example of our Creator trying to help us while we childishly wriggle and squirm for the freedom to hurt ourselves instead. 
It's a huge act of love for God to say, you know, you don't have to prove yourself all the time. (laughs) Instead, how about spending 14% of your life resting? I mean, just looking at that selfishly, we would be smart to take God up on that offer. Plus, you know, if a day of rest was good enough for the creator, it's probably a good idea for the creations too. But even deeper than all that, the Sabbath, I think, is a commandment to live like God and to observe time like God, sanctifying it and and reminding ourselves that, you know, time was God's before God gave it to us. So those, those four commandments are the, the framework for a relationship with our heavenly parent. The other six are about relating to all those heavenly siblings all around us. So here's commandment number five. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So like the one about the Sabbath, this one is telling us what to do rather than what not to do. And the payoff on this one is interesting. I mean, there seems to be a link between honoring our elders and our own longevity. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. I mean, that doesn't compute in a world where the autonomous individual is king, but it makes great sense in a culture where being in community is the equivalent of being alive. That might be a healthy perspective for us. That that we live our best life when we build connections with and learn from those who have walked the path before. Okay, so number six. You shall not murder. Which means, as Exodus later defines it, willfully attacking and killing another by treachery. Well, thank goodness there's at least one commandment that I am not breaking. That's good. But it doesn't take much theological reflection to apply it more broadly. You know, you shall not willfully kill and attack another's reputation or livelihood or way of life. I mean, even if somebody has hurt us, even if we despise that person, that doesn't give us the freedom to hurt that person without the community's sanction. Okay, number seven. You shall not commit adultery. Again, this one's pretty straightforward. Great. Until we start asking, how far do you have to go before you go too far? I mean, what about building an intimate emotional bond with someone when your heart is already bound to somebody else? I think emotional adultery is a thing too because its damage to a relationship can be just as great. Okay, number eight. You shall not steal. Again, another straightforward rule. I don't think I'm breaking that one. Great. And... You know, I knew a clergy person who, who stood in the pulpit and preached sermons off the internet without a single attribution. That kind of seems pretty clearly wrong to me, and, and not just because the act is dishonest, although that would be enough, but because, you know, once someone finds out, and, and, and someone always finds out, then your relationship with your people withers. Okay, well, so then what about taking material from Wikipedia? What about using AI to write a report? I mean, if you're deceiving people by making them think the work is yours, however you do that, that kind of sounds like stealing to me. And speaking of deceiving your community, here's number nine. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, originally, this was about legal testimony, but even in later biblical material, the rules applied to slander more generally. Because at the end of the day, in our relationships with people around us, you know, all we have is our word. Without the trust that represents, there is no community to share. 
And finally, here's number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or wife or slave or ox or donkey or anything else. Now, to me, th this one's always seemed a little unfair. I mean, how, how can I keep myself from wanting something? I mean, it, it might not be my most wholesome thought, but at least as, you know, as long as I don't act on it, don't I get a pass? Apparently not. Because first, covetousness hurts our own hearts by, by setting us up never to be satisfied with the gifts that God does give us. But it also damages our relationships with our neighbors. I mean, maybe I don't actually go steal somebody's stuff, but if I want his stuff and can't have it, then I'm probably not working for his well-being. And if we're not invested in one another's well-being, our community spirals downward. Now, I'm sure there is great advice on that, that best self website. But as it seems to be with so much of our faith, I, I think what God has in mind is this paradoxical truth that we live as our best selves when we limit ourselves for the sake of relationship. You know, relationship with the God who loves us more than anything and relationship with those wonderful, frustrating other humans with whom we share this world. We need the Ten Commandments not as a list of rules, but as a paradigm of interconnected well-being. Okay, so what do we do with that? I mean, how, how might we live God's upside-down logic and be our best selves? Well, maybe try this. Two, two small acts of Lenten self-limitation for you. One oriented to God and one oriented to the people around you. Look, look, look at those first four commandments and ask yourself, what would help me remember that God is God and I am not? <laughs> you know, which of those commandments jumps out at you? Maybe honoring God more regularly or speaking God's name only in reverence or, or remembering to rest as a divine offering. Okay, then look at those six commandments about our relationship with others and ask yourself, how do I need to tie my well-being into their well-being? Which of those commandments jumps out at you? Maybe it's as simple as calling your mom more often or tempering your tongue about somebody you don't like or asking whether you're investing your heart with the person you covenanted to love forever. Remembering these Ten Commandments is, is a good way, I think, to rediscover the upside-down truth of gospel success. That we come out on top when God and neighbor rank ahead of us because our best self is a self in relationship. So welcome once again to the crazy good news of coming in third.